So, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for being here at the Gruner Salon of the Volksbühne. I'm really excited to present the 11th event of the Disruption Network Club. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, I am the director of the Disruption Network Club, and I'm working together with other two wonderful women, Claudia Dorfmuller and Nadia Bakker, that are the project manager of our uh, great conference. And so I really would like would like to ask you first to, to do an applause to them because then we will go into the speakers. <laughs> so I'm also quite excited here because, uh, I mean, now I don't see anybody on stage, but <laughs> I suppose that there is a lot of people. Uh, but I will try to, you know, just behave like nobody's there and then I will feel uh, comfortable. Uh, so I wanted uh, to say that uh, this event, uh, uh, under the name of Prisoners of Dissent, Lock Up for Exposing Crimes, uh, in a sense uh, follow also another event that we did uh, in the past, uh, in November, the Truth Teller events, in which we already started to speak uh, about the discourse of whistleblowing, uh, truth telling, and also a form of persecution on whistleblowers. And uh, first of all, I would like also to thank our funders uh, before going in depth of the event topics. Uh, the Riva and David Logal Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and the Open Society Initiative for Europe, part of the Open Society Foundation. And then, uh, of course, I want to thank a lot the Gruner Salon of the Volksbühne for inviting us here and uh, making us possible to do this event in this great location and uh, uh, our cooperation partners, that are the Whistleblower Network uh, uh, and the Chelsea Manning Initiative Berlin, and uh, finally also our collaboration partner, the Wow Holland Stiftung, the Artist Protection Fund, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and the Resistance Study Initiative, University of Massachusetts Harmst from USA and uh, our media partners, Ex Berliner and Furterfield. So thanks a lot also for all this support. <laughs> so I would say that this event really started with the reflection uh, on how to discuss uh, about the discourse of whistleblowing and in particular about uh, the discourse of repression on whistleblowers. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to have uh, a positive aspect uh, here because uh, uh, we want as well to celebrate the upcoming freedom of Chelsea Manning that will be uh, free the 17th of May. So we thought also to, in a sense, link this event to this really important event that we are going to also address uh, later more in detail. And then also the fact that we have great speakers here, starting with uh, uh, John Kiriakou, that is also launching his book in this occasion, uh, the book that also you find uh, at the entrance uh, over there, uh, under the title of Doing Time Like a Spy. And uh, also I wanted to tell you that we thought uh, uh, that's the income of the book selling of today that start uh, from 10 euro donation will be given to John directly also because he will tell us later he has to uh, afford a lot of cost for his trial and this situation that is also a consequence of a lot of repression as we will say later and so I really hope you want to support him I mean of course he's a really small contribute but uh, I think you know that big change also start from small things so please buy the book and uh, um, so going a bit more into the discourse uh, of the event, um, the important aspect for us was really to try to reflect on this growing number of whistleblower activists and also truth tellers that have been charged with heavy and unproportioned uh, sentences for blowing the whistle, as for example, the Espionage Act that goes back to 1917. And so it's really crazy that, in a sense, still whistleblowers are charged with the legal uh, 
persecution that uh, goes back uh, so much in time. So in a sense, we are part of a legal gray zone here that uh, demonstrates as well that probably in the legal system, there is a lot of uh, non-understanding of what whistleblower does, whistleblower do, and at the same time also I would say in the general society, because often they are persecuted for something that we would define like making social justice. So today we want to speak about that. And uh, so I will start uh, to introduce also our great moderator that I don't see because everything is really dark, <laughs> uh, Magnus Ag. And I turn the page. Um, so we start with the keynote, as I say, of John Kiriakou, and Magnus is our moderator. The title of the keynote is uh, Doing Time Like a Spy, and we twisted a bit the subtitle of the book. And uh, the subtitle we choose for the keynote is uh, on pri prison survival and the CIA's war on terror, because we also thought that was important to focus on this aspect. And just to introduce briefly Magnus, that by the way will be also back uh, later during the panel. He's a Berlin-based international human rights and freedom of expression advocate, and he works for uh, Free Muse an international civic society organizing and defending and promoting the rights, uh, sorry, a civic society organization uh, defending and promoting the right to artistic freedom worldwide. And uh, his work has been also a lot into the discourse of protection since, uh, and also before 2017, when he was also part of the committee to protect uh, journalists uh, in New York. So we also thought that Magnus could be the perfect uh, moderator for this keynote. And just uh, I want to remind you that after the keynote at uh, nine, we will start a panel. And I uh, just briefly mentioned, we will have with us Anima Sean, uh, again, Magnus Ag, uh, and also uh, Annegret Falter. But this is coming after, and I will explain more in detail later. So thanks a lot, uh, John and Magnus, for being here. And I leave the word to you. Thank you. John here. <laughs> hey. I'll just start. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for these, this introduction and, and for the opportunity to be here. I'm really honored to be on a share stage with John Kiriakou. And thanks to the whole uh, Disruption Lab team for putting together this, this impressive panel and wonderful event. I'll do my to uh, make sure it becomes interesting for everyone. Uh, I'm sure. Since you're here, you probably know John already, but John Kiriakou, of course, known for blowing the whistle on uh, on the U.S. government's use of uh, torture and more specifically waterboarding. Back uh, in an interview he did in 2007 with the American ABC News. Uh, before that, and why he was in that position was because John worked 14 years for the CIA. He spent time in Greece and in Pakistan and all over the world, I think, and based in the US on different assignments also. I know he's going to get into more of that later. But after this interview, uh, in which he was the first CIA agent to confirm the use of, of waterboarding, the Justice Department started prosecuting and investigating John, and that ultimately led to uh, three charges of uh, counter espionage, one charge under the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, and one count of making false statements as a result of this interview. That made John one of the eight individuals under the Obama administration that was charged under this Espionage Act in the US that Tatiana also just mentioned from 1917, so it's highly controversial to use this old act that is actually supposed to go against spies not internal people. And following this, John made a plea deal. So he was f found guilty for violating that Intelligence Identities Protection Act as the only thing. The other charges were dropped. But that was a plea deal that resulted in a 30-month sentence. Mm -hmm. And John was then in prison subsequently, being actually, I believe, the first CIA officer ever convicted for exposing information to the press. Um, and then you were 23 months in prison in uh, 
in uh, Laretto, Correction Institution in Pennsylvania, and just been released not too long ago in, in 2015. John has now published this book that Tatiana also mentioned, Doing Time Like a Spy, that is a really interesting read and combines, of course, the whole the legal paradigm of being charged as a whistleblower with then the experience of being imprisoned and how rough the American prison system is and how unfair it is and having someone with John's insight and experience from CIA kind of observing and very much living <laughs> the ex hard experiences is a really interesting insight. So, and I know that's part of what John's gonna go into and I don't wanna take up too much time. I just wanna give the floor to John and say I'm really happy to have you here and uh, we'll be back with a, I'll be back with a Q&A uh, after this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first trip to Berlin, although I've been to Germany many, many, many times. I've never been to Berlin before, and it's just in the matter of two days, it's become my favorite place in the country. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I, frankly, in today's Washington, Washington has become such an angry, hate-filled, bitter, acrimonious city. To come here and see this free exchange of ideas and progressive politics and support for whistleblowers and you know WikiLeaks and it's just it's a different world. I, I've come to the conclusion that that the Europeans are so far advanced compared to the Americans. There's just we should all be ashamed of ourselves. I don't know. I um I've been saying since I got home from prison that the government has made me a dissident. And I only say that half jokingly. I, I actually do feel like a dissident. Not because I've changed. I'm adamant that I haven't changed. My country has changed. I consider myself to be a patriot. I love the United States. I believe in the US Constitution. I believe in our constitutional guarantees and the freedoms that are outlined in the Bill of Rights. And so, as a patriotic citizen, I can only object when I see my government trying to take those rights away from us. I've drawn a parallel in previous speeches with, with a very small country in which I spent two years. It's called Bahrain. And it's in the uh, Arabian Gulf, just off the coast of Saudi Arabia. I was there from 1994 to 1996 on loan to the State Department. And in that position, I was the, um, I was the human rights officer. Now, the United States has a law saying that the State Department has to write a human rights report for every country with which we have diplomatic relations. Well, most State Department officers, I subsequently learned, just go through the motions and put something down on paper and then just send it to Congress. I took that job very seriously. In Bahrain at the time, there was something of an uprising and, uh, and there were extrajudicial killings where the government would just disappear people. Now this is a government that has had historically very, very close ties to the United States. And indeed, the US Navy has a military base there um, which is the headquarters of the Fifth Fleet. So the State Department and the Pentagon have a vested interest in making sure that our relations with Bahrain are very close. I did whatever I could to threaten the Bahrainis and to, um, frankly, ensure that they uh, respected their citizens' human rights. The reason I bring this up is because in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, the United States became just like Bahrain in a lot of ways. Um, we torture prisoners, just like the Bahrainis were torturing prisoners. Nobody's writing a human rights report on us. We use drones to kill people, including American citizens, without benefit of a trial. And then there's no transparency. Nobody ever reports to the press or to the American people what the government is doing in their name. We all complained about George W. Bush and how George W. Bush began this drone war. Well, Barack Obama was far bloodier and far more violent with the use of drones than George W. Bush ever was. We set up an archipelago of secret prisons around the world 
where we could disappear our prisoners, where no one would ever know they were. No one knew if they were alive, and in many cases, after being handled by the CIA, they weren't alive. But there was no price to pay. That's not the American way. That's not the American Constitution. And so again, I concluded that I didn't change. My country changed. As I said, this all started with the Patriot Act, which passed into law in uh, October of 2001. The Patriot Act has legalized governmental actions against American citizens that were absolutely unthinkable just 20 years ago. For example, when I first entered government, one rule was that if NSA picked up the communications of an American citizen or a US person, which is any person in the United States on uh, an alien uh, resident visa, heads rolled. And I mean, even if this information was picked up accidentally, Congress had to be informed, the information had to be deleted from NSA's uh, databases, an investigation was launched. It was a big deal. Well, now NSA has built an enormous facility in the desert of Utah that is big enough to save copies of every email, metadata from every phone call, and every text message made by every American for the next 500 years. Where's the transparency there? Especially when it's law as well as a provision in the NSA charter that NSA is forbidden from collecting information on American citizens. There's just no excuse for it. We Americans have a constitutional right to freedom of speech, and the Supreme Court has interpreted that right to include a constitutional right to privacy. It's just simply none of the government's business what we say in our personal communications. I hear all the time, too, people say, well, I, I don't have anything to hide. That's not the issue at all. The issue, the issue is that it's none of the government's business. Anybody who has spent any time working in the intelligence community will tell you that even if you have nothing to hide, a case can be built against you for just about anything. And I mean just using metadata. Um, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA even have access to the websites that you visited. And just from the metadata of your phone calls, your emails, your text messages, and your website visits is enough to build a story. It's enough to build a case against you. Analysts don't need the actual content of any of this information. I, I made a little list here. They can figure out, are you calling an abortion provider, a divorce lawyer, a secret boyfriend or girlfriend? A substance abuse counselor? What kind of porn do you like? Because there's a record of that. What kind of chat rooms do you go to? What websites do you visit? What organizations do you support or, or belong to? This can all be used to build a case against you. A Harvard law professor by the name of Harvey Silverglate wrote a book in 2012 called Three Felonies a Day. And he argues that we are so over-criminalized in the United States and so over-regulated and over-legislated that the average person on the average day going about his or her normal business commits three felonies every single day. So if you're an activist, if you're a troublemaker or a demonstrator or a hacktivist, and if they want to get you, they're going to get you because the system is rigged against you. Anybody can be made to look like a troublemaker. Anybody. Anybody's life can be twisted to make you look like a threat, a threat to the government, or even a potential criminal. Everybody's a suspect, and that means that the government needs even more money to collect more information in more sophisticated ways to spy on you. And that's what they're doing. And the problem does not end with data collection. Daniel Ellsberg, who most of you know or should know. Daniel Ellsberg is my personal hero. When I was a little boy, I was six years old when Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers. And I remember as a six-year-old, my mother telling me that this man, Daniel Ellsberg, had done a very heroic thing, that he was a hero 
because he had stood up against the war at great personal risk. I was six years old, and I remember that Daniel Ellsberg was a hero in my house. But Daniel Ellsberg told me recently that every dirty trick that the Nixon White House used against him after they had charged him with espionage is now legal under the Patriot Act. The government doesn't have to break into your psychiatrist's office anymore. They can just go to the psychiatrist and demand your files. It's as simple as that. The Patriot Act even makes it mandatory that the local librarian has to turn over to the FBI the list of books that you've borrowed from the library because you may be reading something radical, something dangerous. The Founding Fathers saw this coming. James Madison, who wrote the Constitution's Bill of Rights, um, warned us and argued that the First Amendment has to protect the minority from the majority, ensuring that even in the face of overwhelming pressure, the minority will still have a constitutionally guaranteed right to freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and to petition elected officials. Those rights that are enshrined in the Constitution are the only things that protect us from fascism, especially when we have a fascist wannabe who's been elected president of the United States. I mean, did any of us really think that we would pine for the days of George W. Bush? Really? <laughs> At least we knew what we were going to get. Now we don't even know that. So am I a dissident? I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't really matter to me. The important thing is that I'm, I've become passionate in my defense of our constitutional rights, our civil liberties, and human rights. Um, I will continue to exercise my right to freedom of speech. My right to freedom of speech got me in a lot of trouble, and it made me double down. Uh, no one will take my right to freedom of speech. I'll go to the grave for it. Um, Two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was in a cage in Loretto, Pennsylvania, which I will tell you about in a moment. This is a long way from that cage in Loretto, Pennsylvania. And I have people like you to thank for it. Uh, one of the things that, that a whistleblower fears the most is that he's alone or she is alone in this process. You become an outcast, a pariah. I come from a very large family um, and I have 27 first cousins on my mother's side. Two of them still talk to me because I'm a traitor, right? I ratted out the government, right? Why didn't I let the CIA just do its job? Do you love the terrorists? Yeah, asshole. I love the terrorists. <laughs> but with that said, I have met this entire new community of people of like-minded individuals. We may not agree on every single issue, but we, are, we agree on these issues of civil liberties and civil rights and human rights and personal freedoms. And that's what it's all about. Um, I decided that if David Petraeus can make money out of his situation, so can John Kiriakou. <laughs> so I wrote this book. And uh, <laughs> my, my wife hollers at me all the time because I'm still on, on federal probation, right? So I'm still not free to really do anything. I have, to, I have to check in every week, and I have to fill out a financial disclosure form and get permission to travel, and it's very onerous. And then every couple of months, my probation officer comes to my house, and she goes through my closets and through all of my drawers. And so I said to her one time, why don't you just tell me what you're looking for, and if I have it, I'll give it to you, because I know your time is short, because you have to go through Petraeus's underwear drawer later, don't you? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't think so. My mistake. So this is my revenge right here, my revenge. Um, I would like to read a few passages to you. This book comes out on Wednesday, officially, but we have some advanced copies today. This actually started out as two books. I wrote this like very serious political science book about prison reform and the prison system. It was so incredibly boring. And then I wrote a fun book and I sent them both out to publishers and they said, no, this is one book. Take all the boring political science stuff out 
and just put your letters from Loretto in to the funny book and make it one book. So that's what I did. So I'd like to read a couple of passages. On the morning of February 28, 2013, Jesselyn Radak, Tom Drake, Jim Spione, and my cousin Mark Kiriakou, and his son-in-law Matt McCarthy, drove me to prison in Loretto, Pennsylvania, to drop me off. When we pulled into the parking lot, and I saw the big blue water tank, the double fences with concertina wire, and the roving guard vehicles, I said, holy shit, this is a real prison. I was thankful that I was assigned to the minimum security work camp on the other side of the parking lot. I walked through the front door and announced to the first guard I saw that I was John Kiriakou and I was there to turn myself in. I got to the prison at 10.30 a.m. Because the judge and prosecutors both recommended that I serve my time in the minimum security federal work camp at Loretto, that's where I went when we pulled into the parking lot. A CO, or corrections officer, there told me that all self-surrendering inmates had to go across the street to the federal correctional institution, that's the actual prison, the FCI, uh, to check in first. I went there, said I was there to self-surrender, and said goodbye to my family and friends. A CO then had me go through a metal detector. So far, so good. I had brought nothing but the clothes on my back and a driver's license. The CO asked if I was ready. I am, I said, although I wasn't quite sure what in the world he meant. We walked out of the main entrance, turned right, and began walking around the building to the back of the prison, away from the camp. Wait a minute, I said. I think there's been a mistake. I'm supposed to be at the camp. Not according to my paperwork, he said. Welcome to prison. I told myself to stay calm. You can call the attorneys on Monday and get this worked out, I thought. In the outbuilding at the back of the prison, I went through a more rigorous body check and a more sensitive metal detector. From there, the CO escorted me to receiving and discharge, R&D, inside the main prison building. I was strip searched again, given a cursory medical exam, my fourth DNA swab, and a set of khaki 4XL pants and shirt, which for the next three days I had to use one hand to hold up. They said, sorry, but that's the only size we have. They gave me a pair of blue canvas slippers, a pair of underwear, a pair of socks, and a roll of toilet paper. The CO took a mugshot photo for my identification and put me in a holding cell for 45 minutes. My new first name was Inmate. I was also known as prisoner number 79637083. A second CO finally arrived and took me to my housing unit, Central One, trying to be very helpful along the way by saying things like, you only have 30 months? That's good. A lot of guys die here because their sen sentences are so long. He offered one word of advice. If somebody comes into your room without being invited, that's an act of aggression. Great, I thought. I've been here for 45 minutes, and I'm going to get my ass kicked. He pointed out the hall that I needed to take to get to the cafeteria and said that I would probably have an easy time of things. We arrived in an overcrowded cubicle with three bunk beds. He pointed at a top bunk, said, home sweet home, and walked away. I didn't really know what to do at that point, so I climbed up into the bed and fell asleep. The truth was I was in shock. I figured I would get my bearings when I woke up. I would introduce myself to my cellmates, generally keep my mouth shut, and figure out the lay of the land. Two hours later, I awoke and introduced myself to my cellmates, three Mexican drug smugglers, one of whom was a major prison gang leader, a black drug dealer from Virginia, and a Chinese drug dealer who, despite having been in American prisons since 1988, could barely speak a word, a word of English besides motherfucker which he said in literally every sentence. Soon after awakening, I was sitting in a chair next to my bunk when two neo-Nazis walked in. The first one, a tall, pale skinhead, had a swastika tattoo that took up his entire neck. The other was small and fat with a swastika and white power tattooed on his arms, along with a small skull on his left cheek. I jumped out of the chair and put up my dukes. What do you want, I shouted. And I mean, I, what do you want? Take it easy, the big guy said. Are you the new guy? I kept my fists up. Yeah, so? The big guy leaned in. Are you a fag? No, I said. Are you a rat? No, I didn't have anybody else in my case. Are you a chomo? I had never heard the term before. I don't know what that means, I told him. Chomo, he said slowly, like I was stupid. Child molester. Of course I'm not a child molester, I said. 
outraged. Okay, he continued. You can sit with us at the Aryan table in the cafeteria. <laughs> Great, I thought. So I'm with the Aryans now. <laughs> Sometime later, I was sitting in the chair again when two hugely built African Americans wearing skull caps walked into the room. I recognized them immediately as members of the Nation of Islam. The first one was holding a newspaper, and again I jumped up. Again I heard, take it easy, are you the dude from the CIA? I am, I said warily. He handed me the newspaper. Reverend Farrakhan says you're a hero of the Muslim people. <laughs> we want you to know that you're not going to have any problems with us. <laughs> I thanked him again, and they went on their way. We never spoke to each other again. About a year later, after I had struck up a friendship with a senior captain from one of New York's five organized crime families, the captain stopped me in the hall. Let me ask you a question. Why in the world do you sit with those Nazi retards in the cafeteria? <laughs> I shrugged. I don't know. On my first day, they said I should sit with them. He looked at me like I was the one with the mental handicap. He put his finger in the air dramatically and said, from today, you're with the Italians. <laughs> I attended every Italian party and dinner. We exercised in the yard together and we became good friends. It was an inauspicious beginning, um, but I decided once the shock wore off that I wasn't gonna go to the camp. I called my attorney, I finally got uh, a telephone access uh, after five days, and I called my attorney and I said, hey, listen, they put me in the actual prison with the, the drug kingpins and the murderers and the child molesters. What do I do? And he said, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> he said, we could file an appeal, but it'll be two years before we get a hearing, and you'll be home by then. So I'm sorry, you're just going to have to tough it out. Well, I decided at the end of that phone call that I was trained for this. Loretto, Pennsylvania, and the psychopaths who live in it could not possibly be worse than Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, or Pakistan. And I was going to rely on my CIA training to get through it. I figured I was smart, I was resourceful, as I say on the very first page of the introduction, I'm an asshole when I have to be, I could do this. So what I did was I took an inventory of the life lessons that the CIA had taught me. Now, some of these were actually very formal and some were more informal. One was actually kind of a joke, but it's, it's one that I ended up using with some great regularity while I was at the CIA. So I wrote them down. And then, for the benefit of the reader, I um, tried to explain some of them. I'm not going to read them all. I don't want to spoil them for you. But I'll read some of them to you. Rule number one. The first and most important thing the CIA taught me in operational training at the farm its famed training facility in the Virginia countryside. And the first thing that I set out to do in prison was to recruit spies to steal secrets or anything else that I wanted. This was how success was determined at the CIA. That's how we got promoted. The cool gadgets, technology, and spy gear were all ancillary. The bottom line is you must identify a target, identify his, vul his vulnerabilities, assess his access, and move in for the kill. Every time James Bond goes into Q's workshop for the latest spy gear, every time the NSA rolls out another program to intercept communications, every time a trainee fresh from the farm targets a potential source, he's doing it for one reason, to facilitate the stealing of secrets. But what is a secret? A secret is any piece of information that is not publicly available. But in the context of prison, most secrets are held by the administration and the COs. The only way a secret becomes valuable to an inmate is if that inmate can use it to his advantage. I'm not talking about rumors, which I discuss later in the book, and which you can start for your own purposes. I'm talking about actionable information that you can use to your own benefit. 
It's the same way with unavailable goods, and this is in the prison context. You won't have access to everything that you want or need, and so you'll have to recruit people with access to get them for you. There are four reasons why a person would go against his own best interests to steal something for you. Revenge, greed, ideology, and excitement. The best, for your purposes, is ideology. Even though you may have nothing in common with your target, and even though your interests and backgrounds may be diametrically opposite, you must convince him that you are kindred spirits. If your target is a true believer, he'll do what you want. The ideologues are the easiest to manipulate. They would likely do what you want anyway. They just need a little guidance. I use an example in here. One of my um, cellmates, Robert, he was an Australian arsonist. Um, Robert did something really stupid. He was a, well, we all did. Uh, he was a used car uh, salesman in Buffalo, New York. And he sold millions of dollars worth of cars, but he just didn't like paying taxes on them. So he didn't. Well, one day he went to the, uh, and I should add this was the day before Christmas, he went to the Department of Motor Vehicles to get his new license plates. And at the Department of Motor Vehicles, they told him, you can't have any new license plates until you pay your tax. He was so enraged that he shouted, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to burn this place to the ground. So that night, he went back and he burned it to the ground. <laughs> it took them like five minutes to arrest him. So I say here, I became friendly and later roommates with Robert, the Australian inmate that I mentioned earlier, on my very first day in prison. Robert checked every box on Dr. Robert Hare's book, Psychopathy Checklist Revised. Among the many char characteristics used by psychologists to identify sociopaths is pathological lying, and Robert was a pathological liar. A person with Robert's personality would rarely be motivated by greed or ideology. Frankly, a person with Robert's personality would rarely be motivated by revenge, but he was an unusual case. He was an excitement junkie, first and foremost, and it was very easily, easy to manipulate Robert. You just had to make him feel like he was involved. You wanted to make him admire you and want to like you because his self-centered personality demanded attention. Robert was only interested in other people for what they could do for him whether because being associated with them enhanced his own status or gave him access to people who otherwise wouldn't have spoken to him, or so that he could mark them for his next scam. As long as you know what this kind of person is, you do not need to fear being his next victim, and you can use his sociopathy for your own benefit. Soon after my arrival, the prison went a full week without any meat in our meals in the cafeteria. The problem was that many of the inmates in the kitchen who got no money from home stole the meat before it was cooked so that they could sell it to other inmates. As a result, the chicken pot pie was vegetable pot pie, and the chicken fried rice was vegetable fried rice. All of the meat that had been stolen was for sale in plastic bags in three or four different cells. I understood, of course, that many inmates have a hustle by which they earn black market money, but we were entitled to three and a half ounces of meat at lunch and dinner, and I wanted my three and a half ounces. I immediately went to work on Robert. This is an outrage, I told him. We're being ripped off, and they're taking food out of our mouths. Robert became so angry that he did exactly what I expected he would do. He dropped an anonymous note to the administration, telling them where the meat could be found and who was stealing it. The result was that almost the entire kitchen staff was fired and replaced. The meat sellers were shaken down and the meat confiscated and the meals over the next few weeks were a bounty of meaty goodness. Coincidentally, two of the meat thieves lived next door uh, to Robert and routinely picked on him. As part of the shakedown, they were sent to solitary and eventually to other prisons. Robert would, also, would often ask me, would I make a good CIA officer? My answer was always a resounding no. It was because of his congenital inability to keep his big mouth shut. I did tell him that he would make a good asset, and in the real world, if he had had access to classified information, I would have recruited him. But he loved the clandestinity of doing operations, and he would frequently do things on his own and then report back to me. He recruited somebody in the prison laundry and, very proud of himself, came back to the cell with new sheets, pillowcases, socks, and t-shirts for all of us. Thanks to Robert's successful operation to recruit a spy to steal laundry, 
I had underwear and socks to last a lifetime. <laughs> there were other rules. Uh, just as a broad overview, there are things like seek and utilize available cover. Um, that's at the CIA meant uh, for you to take uh, cover in a gunfight. Uh, in prison, a fist fight can break out at any given moment, and everybody's going to go to uh, to solitary uh, if you happen to be in the area. So you you run away. There were others. One I mentioned was not a serious one, but it was one that I took seriously in prison, and that was um, admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. So. For example, I had been called down to the lieutenant's office where I was constantly harassed by the two investigators there. And they said to me, so there was a fight in your unit last night. Why don't you tell us about it? And I said, there was a fight in the unit last night? Well, I was in the unit all night. I, I didn't see anything. I think you're making it up. We're not making it up, they said. Tell us about the fight. I think you were fighting. I think that's what it was. Why are you fucking with me like this? You're the ones who are fighting. Now you're just trying to confuse me. And finally they said, just get the fuck out of our office. <laughs> and I thought, exactly. <laughs> Number seven, and I hope you don't think less of me as a person after I read this one. Number seven is eliminate potential problems using dirty tricks. I acknowledge that this one doesn't sound very nice. But prison isn't very nice. As in life, you'll encounter people whom you just can't win over no matter how hard you try. Your charms will get you nowhere. At that point, you may have to get nasty. Wallace was a prisoner during my stay in Loretto whom everybody hated, but whose company everybody nonetheless enjoyed. Good looking, smart, and sophisticated in his dealings with others, he claimed to have had a child with an A-list Hollywood star, and he appeared many times in People magazine, and he loved the notoriety. He was well-read, spoke multiple languages, and was an accomplished con man. Wallace was serving 38 months for fraud. He just couldn't help himself. He loved the good life, the fancy restaurants, ocean-going yachts, exotic vacations, and handmade sports cars. He learned the trade from his con man father. Wallace subscribed to yachting magazines and to the DuPont Registry of Homes, and his and he bragged to unsuspecting saps about which yachts in the magazine his family used to own and which mansions and exotic locales he intended to buy when he got out of prison. The funny thing about Wallace was that he was also a coward and a crybaby. Every time he felt stressed, he would pretend to faint, whether it was in court, when he was caught cheating in a poker game, or when he thought he wasn't being treated with due respect in the medical unit. When he wasn't fainting, he was crying. He cried when his lawyer didn't answer the phone. He cried when he didn't get responses to his emails. He cried when he had a visitor. He cried when he didn't have a visitor. I even heard him crying in the shower one time. For all the talk about his money and his Hollywood lifestyle, Wallace only had one visitor the entire time he was in prison. His mother would stay in a local flea bag motel four times a year and visit him on a Sunday morning. But the truth of the matter was that Wallace had stolen from so many people in such a wide variety of schemes that he had no friends. Nobody cared about him enough to come all the way to central Pennsylvania to see him. His father couldn't come because he also faced fraud charges. So because he had no friends on the outside, Wallace focused on making friends on the inside. These friendships were not based on mutual respect and admiration, besides the fact that no one should go to prison to make friends. Instead, they were based on the question Wallace would ask himself whenever he met somebody new. What can this person do for me? He would actually wait for the Friday buses that brought new prisoners from other prisons. Sorry. Pick out those who looked weak, frightened, or alone, and begin ingratiating himself with them. It was even better if they were white-collar criminals with money. Wallace would show them around, generously give them shower shoes and basic toiletries, and then gently start to make his pitch. Wallace had a million different ideas about how to spend other people's money. They usually involved another prisoner's family making a wire transfer to one of Wallace's offshore accounts, sometimes as a direct investment and sometimes for quote-unquote legal services Wallace pretended to provide. Halfway through his sentence, he owed thousands of dollars to dozens of people he had ripped off, and an equal number of people wanted to break every bone in his body. He did a good job of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, and he, owned, he owed every loan shark in the prison money. At the same time, Wallace would come to my room almost every night, 
crying about how he was misunderstood, how he was just trying to be a nice guy and help people, and how he would soon win his appeal, go home, and live the good life again. He would cry at reports that his ex-girlfriend was dating this or that Hollywood star and wail that this was all a big mistake and that he just wanted to go home. And then he would ask me if he could borrow money. About 14 months before Wallace was due to be released, I had had enough. No matter what anybody said to him, he wouldn't stop being a pain in the ass. I was tired of his scams, his cold-hearted thievery, and his constant crying about how he had been wronged. So my closest friend in prison, Mark, and I decided to take action. One of my cellmates was due to be released in a matter of days. Every prisoner approaching release is given a form called a merry-go-round that has all the prison officers listed on it. The prisoner spends his last full day getting somebody in each office to initial the merry-go-round. Then he takes the completed form with him to receiving and discharge to be released. I took my cellmate's merry-go-round, made a photocopy, whited out his name and registration number, and typed in Wallace's information. On a Friday, I waited until the staff left at 5 o'clock, put the new merry-go-round on Wallace's bed, along with a duffel bag that Mark had asked Robert to borrow from the laundry, and I waited. At 5.15, Wallace strolled into the room after dinner, whistling. He picked up the merry-go-round and gasped. Oh, my God, he shouted. What? I said. I'm going home. I must have won my appeal. I'm going home on Monday, he said. What are you talking about? I said. Mark and I put on a good show, acting shocked and thrilled for him at the same time. He was in a frenzy. He ran to the case manager's office to ask for more information, but the case manager was gone for the day. He called his attorney in New York, but even attorneys head home by 5 o'clock on a Friday. He called the federal courthouse in New York. It was closed. Finally, I got him to sit down for a minute. Wallace, I said, let us throw you a party on Sunday night. We want to help you celebrate. He was thrilled. He drew up a guest list, and we set out making pasta with marinara sauce, a tomato salad, and a cheesecake made with mozzarella cheese from the commissary and vanilla pudding that we stole from the cafeteria. In the meantime, I said, he should get that merry-go-round signed before Monday. A lot of the offices are open on the weekend, the chapel, education, recreation, even the lieutenant's office. The only person who would have known that the merry-go-round was a forgery was the case manager, and he was off until Monday. So Wallace got as many signatures as possible over the weekend. He also gave away all of his belongings, which he wouldn't need on the outside. <laughs> on Monday morning, I convinced him that the case manager's signature was not necessary. After all, the case manager was the one who had sent him the release in the first place. After 6 a.m. breakfast, a half dozen of us walked Wallace over to R&D to bid him for uh, farewell. True to form, he cried. He gave each of us a hug and promises of a Mediterranean yacht cruise if we ever ran into each other again. The rest of the story we later got from the R&D uh, corrections officer. Wallace walked in and handed the CO his merry-go-round. Who the hell are you? The CO asked. I'm Wallace. What are you doing here? I'm going home. <laughs> the CO looked at the forged merry-go-round. Turn around. You're under arrest. Wallace panicked. What? Why? Attempted escape. The CO radioed the lieutenant's office. Minutes later, two thuggish COs escorted Wallace to solitary confinement, where he spent the next several months, safely out of my hair. He was then transferred to another prison until his real release. Was this a mean thing to do? You bet it was. But desperate times call for desperate measures. The cops couldn't prove where the forged merry-go-round had come from, so Wallace was never charged with attempted escape. There was no lasting punishment. He didn't even lose his good behavior time. At the end of the day, it was a good little operation. An exhausting pain in the ass was no longer my problem. Wallace's inmate victims were happy that he had gotten what he had coming to him, and I didn't have to listen to that infernal crying anymore. I feel kind of bad a little bit. <laughs> Do you, do you think less of me now? <laughs> a little bit. Sorry. Listen, I say in the beginning of this book that a CIA psychiatrist once told me that the CIA actively seeks to hire people who have sociopathic tendencies, not sociopaths. Sociopaths have no conscience. They can easily pass a polygraph exam because they don't feel any regret or remorse or sympathy, uh, but they're impossible to control. 
people who have sociopathic tendencies do have a conscience and do feel bad about things, but they're perfectly happy to work in moral, ethical, or legal gray areas. As part of my um, application process, I sat in front of a panel made up of a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and a sociologist. And they asked me questions like, would I describe my relationship with my mother? I said, yeah, sure, she's a good mother, and she was nurturing, and you know, I love her. Uh, was your father the disciplinarian of the family? I said, well, no. I, I said, my dad was a big, strong guy, and I think he was probably always afraid he would hurt us if he, if he hit us or something. So no, he was actually j a sweetheart. And they're looking at each other. <laughs> Have you ever betrayed a friendship? I said, oh my gosh, I, I don't think so. I hope not. Let me think about it for a minute. They said, no, no. That's the response we were looking for. I said, okay. So finally they said, we want to ask you an operational question. Let's say that you've been tasked with recruiting an asset overseas. And you work on this guy for six months, 12 months maybe. And you strike up this great friendship with him. And you like him. And he likes you. But you conclude that he's not recruitable. Well, the reason that you were developing him in the first place is because he has a file in his office. And you really need that file. But he's not recruitable. So what do you do? I said, you break into the office and steal it. They said, that's exactly what you do. So I got the job. <laughs> That's my sociopathic tendency. We're close to the time. How much time do I have? OK, five minutes. I'm going to make this one. I'm going to make this one quick. One of the rules is, when you can, let others do your dirty work. I took my rules very seriously when I was in prison, and I tried hard to live by them. They had served me well, and I believed had kept me safe overseas. But near the end of my sentence, I nearly went off the rails because I let emotion get in the way of the rules. After dinner one evening in August 2014, just six months before the end of my sentence, my bunkmate, be knew, he was telling people you were a rat. I could feel my blood pressure rising. I genuinely don't care what people think of me. But calling somebody a rat in prison usually results in blood being spilled, and I had to defend my honor or die trying. Point this guy out to me, Frank. I want to see who this asshole is, I said. The next morning, I met up with my friend Clint for our daily walk around the track. As soon as we saw each other, he said, hey, there was a guy in medical this morning telling everybody that you were a rat. You might want to take care of this before it goes any further. I was incredulous. Point this guy out to me, Clint. Who does this guy think he is? Those are fighting words. I frankly wasn't sure what to do. By saying that I was a rat in public, he was asking for a hearty ass kicking. I knew that if I were to deliver it, I would likely spend the rest of my sentence in solitary. I didn't care. I was furious. And God knows I've lived in worse places over the previous 25 years than the solitary confinement unit in Loretto, Pennsylvania. At dinner that evening, both Frank and Clint pointed out the transgressor. I had never seen him before. He was definitely new. He was about my age, thinner, six feet tall, and with a bushy beard covering a severely pockmarked face. He got a tray of food and sat with the Aryans. I was at the next table sitting with the Italians. I fixed a stare on him. Hey, I shouted, you have a problem with me? About 50 heads turned, including several COs. The cafeteria is the only place where the COs worry about their safety. It's the only place where they're generally outnumbered 50 to 1 at any given time. Consequently, they are always attuned to any hint of trouble. You know what I said. You know where I live, he responded. Fuck that, I shouted it too loudly. Again, heads turned. If you have something to say to me, you say it now and we settle this. Right here. A young Aryan ran over to me. Please don't fight here, he said. If you do, the cops will send all of us to solitary. I didn't care. I was ready to do it. In the meantime, the bearded guy and I were in a staring contest. As I weighed in my mind what to do next, Pete, the Bonanno family crime captain, gently tugged at my sleeve. What in the world are you doing? He asked quietly. Are you crazy doing this in the cafeteria? As God is my witness, Pete, I'm going to kill this guy, I said, still staring. No, you're not. 
you're going to go to Mark's room and you're going to sit and read the USA Today while we take care of this. I was still furious, but I knew that I wasn't thinking straight. I took Pete's advice, sat down, quickly ate my dinner, and went to Mark's room. Mark and Polly Apostolopoulos showed up a few minutes later. They were bemused by how angry I was. I was spewing epithets. I wanted to kill this guy, or at least I wanted everybody around me to believe that I wanted to kill this guy. I was so furious that I had completely forgotten the rules. I should have been thinking about eliminating potential problems using dirty tricks, or about knowing my enemy. But as things stood, I just wanted to see the guy lying in a pool of his own blood. Mark smiled at me. I have never seen you work this worked up before. What did this guy, how did this guy get to you? Nobody else has. I couldn't explain myself. Maybe it was because I had worked so hard to cement relationships with such diverse groups all over the prison. Maybe it was because nobody had ever called me a rat before. Maybe I just didn't want to take any shit from this white piece of, or this piece of white trash. Mark handed me a soda and said that he and Polly would be back in a few minutes. I perused the USA Today sports section, unable to focus. Mark and Polly returned about 15 minutes later. Everything's taken care of, Mark said. What's that supposed to mean, I said, still incredulous. It means it's all taken care of. This guy's not going to be a problem. Mark and Polly were smiling at me. Mark continued, the guy apparently didn't realize that you're a highly respected member of the prison community, and especially of the Italian community. <laughs> we made sure that he understood that. Okay, I said, I'll take your word for it. A moment later came the call for a 10 minute move and I went back to my room. Five minutes later, I was sitting on the edge of my bed reading the Wall Street Journal. It was the middle of the 10 minute move. Excuse me, the voice was to my left. I turned, I looked up and I saw the guy. It looked as though his face had recent, has recently undergone a serious rearrangement. His left cheek was swollen, blood was drying in his left nostril, and his hair was askew. Now was not the time to feel sorry for him. What the fuck do you want? I shouted. He hung his head down. I'm very sorry for what I said about you, he said, near tears. I should never have said it. I want you to know that I'll never say it again. <laughs> I looked at him for a moment, and I had to appear tough. Get the fuck out of here before I break your legs too, I, sh I shouted. My wife hates this story, she hates it. He turned and walked quickly all the way out of the housing unit. I went back down to Mark and Polly's room at the next move. I really appreciate you guys stepping up for me, I said. They laughed. You're always talking about those damn rules, Mark said. I figured somebody should take them seriously. Well, I've used too much time but we did uh, block off some time for Q&As. I apologize that the lights are in my eyes and I literally can't see a single one of you. So maybe uh, somebody in the audience has a microphone. Yeah, yeah, I, that one. I, uh, you can have that one. And they can help us spot who's asking. I, I thought I would start with uh, a few questions and then we have like half an hour, so please uh, start thinking of some good questions for John. I can imagine there's people out there that have some really good ones. I want to start off with maybe just my background. I think part of the reason why Tatiana asked me to do this was uh, I worked for five years with the Committee to Protect Journalists, the New York-based uh, press freedom organization, and I joined in early 2010, moved to New York. Obama had been in office for like a year. It was optimistic times in the human rights community still. And I remember this organization founded in the early 80s with American journalists realizing we have the First Amendment, but our colleagues around the world don't. And we can use journalistic tools to help them get out of prison or bad situations. And kind of this outward looking American based organization that then gradually grew into, and while I was there, realizing not that we ignored the US, but the focus was just from the start on the other, like abroad, kind of starting to organize yourself differently internally to be better at looking at the U.S. and then suddenly f seeing all these leaked prosecutions. Yeah. Um, with the Obama administration, some were, of course, initiated before Obama under Bush, but it really took this whole organization by surprise how significantly and how 
Like it's eight prosecutions under the ex Espionage Act, just which is more than any other, or all other U.S. presidents combined. It, it's so, almost three times the number of all previous presidents combined. Which is mind-boggling, taking Obama as the candidate who came in promising an open, transparent government and all these things. So it kind of, us as a press freedom group, thought we have to do something about this. And we uh, engaged uh, Len Downey Jr., the former executive editor of the Washington Post, this, like a f big figure in U.S. journalism. He was the editor from, like, e executive editor from 91 to 2008, and he was an editor back during Watergate, one of the few that knew who Deep Throat was the source for. So, so he's, he, he, he doesn't vote because he wants to seem impartial, so it was really scoop for us to, to get him on board and could kind of address this, and your case was, of course, one of these significant leaked prosecutions that we were looking at. So once Tatiana asked me to do this, I thought, how about I email Len and ask what would his question be for you? That's a great idea. So here it goes. I was surprised by the simplicity, and I had something similar in mind, but I, I really like it. So would you do it again? And if so, is there anything you would do differently? Absolutely, yes, 100%, I would do it again. But I made a mistake. And the mistake is, and this is what I would do differently, um, the mistake is that I hired an attorney after blowing the whistle on the CIA's torture program. If you are considering becoming a whistleblower, you have to have legal advice before you go public. My problem was that I had to be reactive. And so I was reacting to the FBI launching an investigation. I was reacting to the CIA engaging with the Justice Department. And I felt like I was always behind the eight ball. If I had gone to an attorney first, I could have better crafted the message to protect myself. And especially in national security whistleblowing cases, there are attorneys who specialize solely in national security cases. There aren't a lot of them, but there are you know, six or eight in Washington. And so uh, this is something that I, that I wrote to Ed Snowden um, in, in an open letter that I wrote from prison. Hire the best national security attorneys that money can buy. And indeed, he, he ended up hiring my attorneys, which I thought was a smart thing. Um, but yeah, get legal advice first. That was a mistake that I made. And, and in that process, I'm really fascinated with your rules that you, you come up with. And I think for this uh, whistleblower community and activist human rights community, a lot of us, you could claim are a little naive or don't have this CIA security training of surviving. So I thought it was a really interesting take for me. And I think it's something we probably in the West or like in stable situations, like s privately and yeah. in relatively stable democracies that are governed to some extent by the rule of law. I think we sometimes underestimate the stress level you're under when you make these decisions and trying to make it also like a global argument. You worked in in Pakistan, Afghanistan, you worked in a lot of uh, high tension areas. And I, I was wondering, kind of inspired of, uh, last year I was in North Korea as a tourist, hiding my human rights background. But I, after a week there on a group tour where we were just like taken to this one monument after that, we actually didn't have to do much. Mm -hmm. I was so exhausted. I was like the last night in the hotel, I was exhausted from keeping these two parallel worlds up, not knowing if there's anything rational, strategy to get out of it. I'm pretty sure I would get out, but I wasn't sure because Kim Jong-un killed his uncle a little while earlier. And that made me come to this realization about all these people I work with in the human rights field. The level of stress, like the rational decision from me sitting in Berlin, oh, I should change something or argue for this law to change, is fairly easy compared to being threatened at a daily, on a daily basis, not knowing where the threat is coming from. And I thought, Having, I, I couldn't find a better person to ask this question because you've been like you've been in Pakistan, you've been trained by the CIA, you've been up against the U.S. government with their whole legal, big legal teams, and you've been in a U.S. prison with some very harsh conditions. How do you, as an activist or someone under threat, like strategize in those situations? How do you think forward? How, do you have good advice? Boy, that's that's a hard question. First, let me, let me elaborate a little bit on the, on the stress, the issue of stress. The CIA has the highest rate of divorce in the entire US government. We're trained to lie. 
We lie all the time. You lie for a living. It's your job, right? I had passports from six different countries in six different names and with six different backgrounds. And I had to keep all of that straight in my head. So it's very stressful crossing hostile borders, working in, in uh, war zones. I was twice the target of assassination attempts, once in the Middle East and once in Athens when I was there. Unfortunately, in Athens, they killed my next door neighbor instead, the British defense attache. So the stress level, as you can imagine, is off the charts. It was nothing compared to the weight of the entire US government crashing on my head in January 2012. But it started well before January, even though I had no idea. Before I got arrested, I was the senior investigator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Important job, most prestigious committee on Capitol Hill. John Kerry was the chairman at the time. And one of the things I loved about that job was uh, you're invited to lunch all the time by foreign diplomats. And I loved the, conta the contact and the intellectual exchange. So I got a call from a Japanese diplomat one day, and he invited me to lunch at a little restaurant on Capitol Hill. I gladly went. And I remember that lunch being delightful. We talked about Israeli elections and Turkish elections and the peace process. And near the end of the lunch, he said to me, so what's, what's next for you? And I said, actually, I'm thinking of resigning. I promised Senator Kerry that I would give him two years. It's been two and a half, and I think I'd like to go into business uh, for myself. And he got very excited, and he said, no, don't do that. If you give me information, I can give you money. And I said, what's wrong with you? You know how many times I've made that pitch in my career? <laughs> so I got up and I left. And I went directly to the office of the Senate security officer. And I said, I was just approached by a foreign intelligence officer. He offered me cash for money. He told me to write it up as a memo, and he sent it to the FBI. Two days later, the FBI sent two agents to Capitol Hill to interview me. And I told them the story. They said, OK, here's what we want you to do. We want you to call him back invite him to lunch and try to get him to tell you exactly what information he wants and how much he's willing to pay for it. I said, okay. I said, do you want me to like wear a wire or something? They said, no, no, we're going to be at the next table. We're going to listen to the whole thing. I said, okay. So I called him. I invited him to lunch. He said yes. And then the day of the lunch, they called me and said that something had come up. They couldn't be there, but I should go forward with the lunch and write up another memo and tell them what happened. So I did. And then they asked me to do it a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time. The fifth lunch, he said he had just gotten his dream job. He was going to be the number two at the Japanese embassy in Cairo. And nice to know you. I said, great, good luck, nice to know you. Never saw him again. A year later, I'm arrested. And as part of the case, the government has to provide what's called discovery. So all the evidence that they've collected against me, they have to turn over to the defense. And it was in that discovery that we learned that there never was any Japanese diplomat. He was an FBI agent, undercover, trying to get me to commit real espionage. But I kept reporting the contact back to the FBI. And finally, they said, look, this guy's not going to take the money. So we might as well just end the operation. And that's why he said he had transferred to Cairo. I said to my attorney, why would they do this? And he said, because they have a shit case and they know it's a shit case. But learning that they had gone to those extremes to charge me with a crime that sometimes carries the death penalty with it, that is stress, let me tell you. I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I came out of my attorney's office one day to go back home. We had met. And um, my judge had denied, uh, we made 72 motions to declassify documents, 72 different documents. And she denied all 72 motions. And so we were leaving the courtroom, and my attorney said, we have no defense. If we don't have those documents, we can't defend you. I said, well, what do we do? 
He said, we take a plea. I said, if we take a plea, I go to prison and I haven't done anything wrong. What I did was in the public interest. And he said, it doesn't matter. The judge won't let you have a defense. So we went back to the office and we met about this. I was so depressed and upset. I left the office. I went to the subway to go back home. And I was standing on the edge of the platform and I was watching the train come up through the tunnel. And I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump in front of this train. And I stood right at the edge of the platform. And as the train is coming up, I said, that's what they want me to do. They would win if I did this. And I have five kids at home. And I said, no. I decided that day, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight them. And this isn't just me. Every national security whistleblower will tell you a variation of the same story. Tom Drake will tell you the same thing. Bill Binney, who was pulled naked out of a shower and cuffed behind his back with one leg, because obviously he's such a danger to the American people, he'll tell you the same thing. Jeffrey Sterling, the CIA whistleblower, called me four times the day before he left for prison to tell me four times that he was going to kill himself that day. So the stress is unlike anything I've ever experienced. I mean, I've gone through a divorce. I've gone through two assassination attempts. Um, my father fell down the steps in front of me and hit his head and died. It was nothing like this. And then on top of that, add a million dollar legal bill and then see how you're going to dig your way out of it and see what kind of mood you'll find yourself in. Yeah. Well, Sorry. Yeah. Very depressing. No, yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. very depressing. Sorry. But, but I... Uh, you know, I was lucky. I was luckier than Tom and, and some of these other guys because my wife stood by me. My wife was also a senior CIA officer, and she was fired the day of my arrest only because she was married to me. And I was leaving the courthouse after having been arraigned, and she called me, and she said that she was fired. And I was devastated. I said, honey, I'm so sorry. And she said, no, I'm not. And this is after 15 years. She said, I'm not. I told them, that's okay because I don't want to work for any organization that treats my husband the way you've treated him. So I was lucky in that respect. And it was because I had the support of my wife and kids that I got through it. Great. And then maybe one quick question. Yeah, yeah. she was great. Uh, these rules that I think was part of your solution, as you also described, I, I just want to read out a few. You mentioned some of them, and some of them will be repeated. but. Number three, for example, and these are the John's rules that he learned at the CA and, and used in prison, and it's in this book. John was kind enough to send a PhD a couple of weeks ago, so that's why it looks like this on my part. Um, admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. That's one you already went through. Then you have another one that is uh, eliminate potential problems using dirty tricks. I, th tricks. I think you mentioned that one too. And then you... Uh, have number 17, trust no one. Mm -hmm. And number 19, always maintain plausible cover for action. Right? Yes. I was thinking in this how to survive as a whistleblower and an activist, but also then being an idealist, blowing a whistle. Like, this is so not <laughs> idealistic, right? <laughs> no. This is so <laughs> cynical. cynical. It's <laughs> me surviving. And there's an interesting dilemma there in how uh, and how do you balance that of being I'm a whistleblower but I'm also I can do whatever it takes to survive it's cynical I admit and again it's you have to develop the ability to turn it on and off now I have this core this fundamental core um, ethical and moral belief my own ethical and moral belief system that's a constant for me but if I'm in danger, or potentially in danger, I'll bend that system to protect myself. I, that, that doesn't sound very nice, but, you know, prison's not very nice. And so, you know, one, one thing, one way in which I've changed, um, and this kind of goes to the question, is I became far more ideological in this experience. You know, I, I'm a third generation progressive Democrat, right? 
my parents marched against the war in Vietnam and marched for civil rights with Martin Luther King. And so I, I come from an, a politically active left-wing household. But the Democratic Party has become the Republican Party light, right? Hillary Clinton never saw a war she didn't love and want to jump into. And pretty much all the other mainstream Democrats are like that. Well, my core belief system didn't change. The Democratic Party did. And so I became far more ideological. My friends would argue far more left-wing. Um, I see it as consistency. Yeah, I think you <laughs> appreciate your honesty also. It's really like, I think we can all learn a lot from this. And I want to open it up to all of you. I'm sure you have uh, questions. So I have a hard time seeing <laughs> anything but hands even more but there's one there mm -hmm. is there more there's one there i think maybe we could do like two or three questions and then john can answer them so we go first here yeah yeah thank you uh what i learned in law school was that there's no democracy without rule of law or no rule of law and human rights without democracy um so apparently what you have revealed what it was known have revealed is basically when it comes to digital, the digital space, there is no democracy, there is no rule of law, considering that we have more and more digital, we're moving towards a, an age of no rule of law and no democracy. Would you agree with this? Because this is like a concern that I, I'm a bit unsure about. I, I would agree with that because um, these losses of our freedoms have been incremental. And the government always couches its defense of taking away those freedoms in terms of national security, right? We have to give up some rights in order to protect ourselves from the terrorists. I would argue exactly the opposite. I would rather be the victim of a terrorist attack than to give up my rights. Um, Americans have, have fought and died for 240 years to protect those rights. And now we're just gonna give them away with a stroke of a president's pen, instead of the laws, especially in the United States, being adapted to remain in line with advances in the digital world, we're regressing and we're losing those rights, I think far more quickly than anybody ever anticipated. Um, I'm worried about it. I consider myself a part of the libertarian left now. Uh, and it's because I have found that the ideological spectrum is not necessarily a straight line. I think it's more of a circle. And I think the left and the right meet at a certain point where it comes to respect for individual freedoms and civil liberties. Um, I think that more and more Americans are coming around to that point of view. Certainly the last election showed that they were um, between Bernie Sanders and Gary Johnson, uh, millions of people voted uh, for, for human rights and civil liberties. But I think it's probably not enough, not yet. The, the bottom line for me is I'm really not optimistic about this in the short term. Thank there you. was one here and then two over here afterwards. Um, hi, I just want to thank you as a fellow American for uh, revealing what you did about thank the CIA you. program and our public interest. It's a hugely important moment in, in our history and you're really a hero. Oh, thank um, you very much. I wanted to ask you about the ABC interview that you gave at that moment where you gave that interview. If you could speak a bit about the state of mind that you were in at that time and what you expected would happen and how you uh, would see what the consequences were in hindsight. How would you describe the differences between what you expected would come of that moment and what has happened since? The big difference is that I underestimated the CIA's response. Um, I'll start at the beginning. So I gave this interview to ABC News in December 2007 in which I said three things that have completely changed the course of the rest of my life. I said the CIA was torturing its prisoners I said that torture was official US government policy. It was not the result of a rogue officer, as President Bush had said that week. And I said that the torture program had been personally approved by the president himself. The next day, the president made the oddest statement. He said, these were his exact words. He said, I don't know this man. I don't know this man's motivation. I don't know why this man threw me under the bus. 
which was interesting because that's an admission that there was a torture program that he approved. <laughs> anyway, within 24 hours, um, the FBI began investigating me. I know that because they leaked it to CNN, which was a crime, a violation of the Espionage Act, ironically. And so they investigated me from December of 2007 to December of 2008. And then in December of 2008, they informed my attorney that the case was closed because I had not committed a crime. And I celebrated. What I did not know was that three weeks later, when Barack Obama became president, the CIA asked him to secretly reopen the case against me. I had no idea that I was under investigation. And so I went about my life. I got a job on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, I got my security clearance back. Uh, I, I took international trips. I went to Somalia and Yemen and Djibouti and all over the place, Afghanistan twice, uh, serving my country, right? It wasn't until three years later in January of 2012 that I was finally charged with five felonies, including three counts of espionage. It was like being hit in the head with a brick. I never expected it. Not only did I never expect it, I certainly didn't expect it from Barack Obama. You know, I believed in the whole hope and change thing. Uh, I volunteered for the campaign. I voted for him. I took my kids to the inauguration so they could see this glorious historic moment. You know, we had taken back the White House. The warmonger Bush was out. We booed Cheney when he came on the, the podium. Um, and it was all just a big lie. It was all a big lie. But what was in my mind was the president has been lying consistently to the American people. I'm going to set the record straight because the American people have the right to know what their government is doing in their name. Great, thanks. And I think, is there, were there two in this? Yeah, one to the right of you as well. We could do both at the same time because we're running a little short on time. Okay. Um, John, I um, very liked uh, your, uh, how you told the uh, two states of minds. You have uh, one, uh, the moral guy, the good guy, and when you have to defend yourself, then you adopt dirty tricks. And I guess that's, that's also a kind of model of Western societies now, because under threat or so-called th uh, threat, um, societies are playing dirty tricks, or at least governments are playing dirty tricks with all this surveillance stuff. I don't want to go further. But it would be interesting to know the dynamics, how you act from one state to the other, and when you decide to leave the dirty trick models and to come back to the good guy models, because maybe we can learn from it. Yeah, that's and a Can we just have question. the other oh, question? Sorry, yes. the, just to great question. There's Thank another you. one. In the, uh, I think it's better if you answer the question first because it's a completely different question. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So <laughs> I'll do it call. quickly. Let's do that. Yeah. I'll do it quickly then. Um, to tell you the truth, I, I haven't used these rules since the day I, I walked out of prison. Uh, they, they're, they're too cynical uh, to, to be used in daily life. You, you can't. You'll make yourself crazy. You'll make yourself depressed. People won't like you. you know, and what I wanted to do was to rebuild my relationship with my wife and my children to put this whole prison thing behind me. The writing, writing the book itself was cathartic and it was like therapy for me. So I wanted to get it out. I wanted to get it off my mind. And to tell you the truth, six months into writing this book, I stopped having the PTSD prison dreams. I had the same dream like every night that I was out and I realized I shouldn't be out and it was approaching midnight, and midnight is count time, and I couldn't figure out how to get back into prison, and I was afraid they were gonna send me to solitary then. So it, it took me six months before I, I stopped having those dreams. And I think it was because I was able to turn it off and turn my back on those rules. These, these are not mentally healthy things to do in your daily life. So don't use this as some kind of psychological guide to, you know, get your life in order. It's going to fuck you up. You're not, it, don't, don't do that. Thanks. Um, my question is, um, you have obviously been convicted for um, exposing a very specific crime. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do the CIA, for example, now 
ensure that you won't leak anything else. And my other question is, do you feel now that you can speak completely freely? Oh, also good questions. Yeah, I was convicted of violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act of 1982. I was only the second American ever to be charged with uh, that crime. And, and here was the circumstance. A reporter was writing a book about uh, the, the CIA's rendition program. I really didn't know anything about rendition, not directly. Rendition is kidnapping, and I, I wasn't a kidnapper. So uh, I said, look, I'd like to help you, but I can't. So he sent me an email with a list of a dozen names. He said, do you know any of these people? Can you introduce me to them so I can ask for an interview? I said, I don't know any of these people, which was true. And then he sent me another email and he said, what about these people? I said, no. I said, listen, you obviously know this issue so much better than I do. I just can't help you. And then he said, what about the guy that you mentioned in your book, my first book? Um, he says, I think his name is, I'll say John. And I said, oh, you're talking about John Doe. I don't know whatever happened to him. He's probably retired and living somewhere in Virginia. But I had confirmed the name, John Doe. That's what they got me on. That was a crime. Now, with that said, people do that every day in Washington. You pick up the Washington Post or the New York Times, and there's a CIA officer who's undercover. He's named. David Petraeus exposed the names of 10 covert operatives to his adulterous girlfriend. There was a disgruntled CIA officer in Bethesda, Maryland, who revealed the names of seven CIA officers. Neither one of them were charged with violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act. Why was I? Because I blew the whistle on the torture program. And that's what made me realize that this wasn't about leaking a name. This was about torture. From the very beginning, they were furious because I had revealed the CIA's dirty laundry in the press. And they were unforgiving. Great. We're running out of time, but there's another uh, Q&A. Say again. Uh, I think the other yes. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know what? There's absolutely nothing um, that they can do that can stop me from, I mean, I could stand up here and make a list of all the, every CIA person I ever worked uh, with. I, I wouldn't do that. It wouldn't serve any purpose. Uh, but there's really nothing that they can do. You know, th there's a legal term for that. It's called gray mail. Uh, one of the things that my attorneys uh, said to the prosecution, because the prosecution was originally asking for 45 years in prison. I ended up with two and a half. But they were asking for 45 years. It's a death sentence. So... I said, listen, if they're going to go for 45 years, I'm going to testify on my own behalf, and I'm going to talk about some ugly shit that I have seen over the course of 14 and a half years at the CIA. And if they really want all their nasty, dirty little secrets covering the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times, let's go for it. And then they said, uh, how about two and a half years? I think last question from the floor down here. What, it, what advice would you give to someone being investigated under the Espionage Act, uh, asking for a friend? Um, number one, hire the best national security attorneys that money can possibly buy. I had Plato Kacharis and Bob Trout of Trout Kacharis, and I had Mark McDougal from Aiken Gump and Strauss, I ended up having 11 attorneys, and that's why I'm still $880,000 in debt. Uh, but they earned their, their money. I'll never pay that money. I don't ha I'll never have $880,000. But what I gave them, th they earned. That's number one. Number two, don't trust anybody. Don't talk to anybody. Don't give any interviews because You'd be surprised how many people are secretly working for the FBI. I was surprised. It seemed like everybody was working for the FBI. Don't tweet anything or Facebook anything. Anytime I'd make it, uh, for example, I, somebody tweeted um, to me one night, would you do anything differently? And I said, yes, I would shout it from the rooftops. And believe me, the U.S. Attorney's Office was on me the next day like white on rice. 
saying that they were going to charge me with obstruction of justice because I was threatening to reveal more classified information. I said, I'm not. It's a tweet, for God's sake. So don't talk, don't tweet, don't interview, don't Facebook, don't do anything. Just keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, and rely on your attorneys. Great. Thank you very much. I, just to round up this part, I thought uh, just to look forward a little bit, and with you saying everyone works for the FBI, one guy that doesn't, James Comey, <laughs> just, or doesn't anymore, right? I was thinking in a time spent, like immediate now and then maybe three, four years forward, how should we approach this and maybe with the James Comey thing, your insights on an agency, I know you don't like the FBI too much and see big differences between the FBI and the CIA, of course, but do you see a lot of leaks from the FBI or the CIA with this whole situation and the whole Trump presidency and then carry that into like what should we expect and how should we react in the coming three yeah. years? The FBI leaks like a sieve. They leak almost as much as the Defense Department leaks. It's comical how much they leak. In fact, um, I, I say this in the book. I, 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 it's a very quick story. Um, when I was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I got a lunch invitation from a reporter. This reporter had a very bad reputation. He worked for the conservative paper in Washington, and I just deleted the request. But he was persistent, and he asked me like a second time and a third time. And finally, I said to my boss, this guy keeps asking me to lunch. I keep deleting the request, but he's persistent. So my boss said, I'll authorize the, uh, the lunch. Go ahead and see what he wants. So I went, and I met with him. And at the end of the lunch, he lowers his voice, and he says, I have a source at the FBI, and he says that you're under surveillance. I said, I was shocked. I said, for what? And I was, in, I was a surveillance instructor at the CIA. I never saw any surveillance. So he said, they think that you're the source of the Sam Adams project. And I said, what's the Sam Adams project? And he said, that's not really the response I was expecting. I said, I don't know what the Sam Adams project is. He said, it's this ACLU effort to defend the uh, Guantanamo detainees. I said, I've never heard of it, and I've not spoken to anybody at the ACLU. But I stupidly dismissed it as a mistake. I should have realized that when the guy said, I have a source at the FBI, and they have you under surveillance, you would think that with a normal person, they would appreciate that information and they would do something about it. I just kept right on giving interviews and poking the hornet's nest on the committee by, I was investigating, I had three different investigations of the CIA going on at one period. So um, I didn't take it seriously. Uh, frankly, that's what your friend should take seriously too. Everybody's leaking, they're talking about you. You know, the famous uh, saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. They're out to get you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think if we leave it at that, Tatiana, do you have something you want to? Yeah. Yep. Let's, let's clap. Oh, no. thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. So thank you very much for this really interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Just want to say that now we do 15 minutes break and then we uh, go on with the panel afterwards. So I would say we, what time is it? We go on at 9.20. So please don't go away and remember to buy the book of John. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>